Perfect. Okay. Well, welcome all. I'm glad to have you join us on this exciting conversation. My name is Alina Zazemzuk. I use she and her pronouns, and I am the Social Issues and Awareness Programmer for the Campus Event Board at UW Bothell. I will be moderating the conversation today. We wanted to welcome everybody to the event. Today, we're going to be speaking about the importance of Latinx representation within an institutional system. Before we get started into the conversation, we wanted to read the Respect and Community Agreement. By participating in this program, I agree to be respectful of my fellow community members and participants as we engage in this safe space and dialogue together. If you do not agree to these community agreements or would like to include something else, please do so at this moment. Thank you for your time and agreeing. I'm going to check the chat right now to see if uh, I missed anything or if I need to let anybody in. Perfect. Now we would like for everybody to participate in a quick survey to get you into the headspace of our conversation. I'm gonna give you one to two minutes to answer um, the questions and I'm gonna send it right now. These are just some questions to kind of get you um, thinking about the topic today and to kind of jumpstart your memory to see if you've ever encountered any of these situations or identify with any of them. Okay, we're at one minute. So I'm gonna give everybody one more minute to answer them and then we will end the poll. Right, 30 more seconds. I hope everyone is staying dry today. It's been raining like crazy these last couple of days. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you all for answering. I'm going to be closing the poll now. Awesome. Okay. So the focus of our conversation today will be on the Latin Latinx community in relation to the healthcare system. Because many students at UW Bothell or their families may be affected by the lack of representation, we thought it was important to discuss why and how it affects this demographic and to also share information and resources that may help anybody in the future. In the state of Washington, the Hispanic population reached around 9,099 9, individuals in 2019, about 13.3% of Washington's total population. 9,999 9, 9, <laughs> 898 people who were about to be affected by the COVID pandemic. I am so sorry. I, I should have practiced saying that number <laughs> before. 
Data that was gathered from the Latino Physician Workforce Project reported that most Latinos in Washington state tend to live near areas where there is a high demand for agricultural labor. This is also where COVID-19 hit the hardest. And incidentally, there is the least amount of representation for these communities within their healthcare institutions. With that being said, I would like to introduce our three guest speakers, Amber Tafoya, Antoinette Angulo, and Aida Hidalgo, who have dedicated their work and time into creating solutions and have brought these findings to light to improve lives. Amber is a communication specialist working at the Latino Center for Health, the first research center in Washington focusing on promoting Latino health. She is also a graduate student earning her master's degree in cultural studies here at UW Bothell. She collaborated on Bridge, a year-long multimedia project aimed at connecting community members with organizations in Washington to share li lived experiences during the pandemic. Antoinette is a policy director at the Latino Center for Health. She is also a public health practitioner and an activist who has worked with the Latin community in the United States and Latin America for over 20 years. It's a long time. She is passionate about creating evidence-based policy aimed at improving health within the Latinx community. Aida is an affiliate at the Latino Center for Health and Promotora de Salud, working with the Mexican consulate to improve access to healthcare for the Latinx community. She also participated in the Bridge Project alongside Amber. Now we're gonna be moving on to the moderated part of this conversation. There is an eight to 10 minute estimate response time for each question. And during this time, we hope to hear from all our speakers. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat. We will be keeping, keeping track of them or hold on to your questions until the Q&A section at the end. We do ask that you please stay on mute until the Q&A portion of the event, but we encourage you to turn on your camera to make our guest speakers feel more welcome. Okay, so Amber, um, I would like you to start us off with this conversation. Um, what has inspired you to embark on the journey of working with the Latinx community in the healthcare system? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Alina. Thanks for the introduction. You know, I think one of the things I, I want to point out, while I have a experience and a career built on communications, this is a um, this journey is somewhat new for me. I started out in journalism after getting my BA in journalism, editing and designing for newspapers over 10 years ago, um, and, and websites. Eventually, I transitioned to websites. And I really liked focusing on creating content for Latinx communities coming from my experience living in San Antonio, Texas, um, my family history. We have deep roots in New Mexico, Colorado. And it's just it's hard to find that that representation, find those stories, right? And the, the information that you need as a community. And I love this work, you know, and I moved on, I transitioned to working for nonprofits in the Seattle area and working with activists. And with that work, I really, um, I was able to create content for, for diverse audiences, especially when working uh, with activists. So I learned a lot about audience building. And then I was introduced to LCH last year after starting grad school, uh, one of the co-directors invited me to apply for a student position. I applied and stayed on because I knew there was a real need for support in Latinx communities as the pandemic stresses continue to rise and more and more problems were emerging from our communities. And I, I wanted to be at least a small part of the solution, right? And work with folks who were trying to solve these problems um, within you know, the university and outside the university. Uh, so right now I create messaging and publications in collaboration with my team. And I really apply what drove me as a journalist. You know, I was going back to that, to that, to that initial kind of push into my career and, um, and working with nonprofits because I want communications to be accessible. Um, and so that's really what I, if you know, if I had like a poster right on my desk it would, or on my wall it would be like accessible language, accessible communications. And that means that different things for different people. Uh, and so it's something that I'm always trying to keep in mind. And I guess my other inspiration really is my, my sister, Jennifer. She is a nurse practitioner in San Antonio for the UT Health Systems. And she's my little sister, she's my hero. And um, I think about her all the time as I do this work. 
Thank you. Aida, uh, would you like to share with us how you started this journey in, in the healthcare system and, and working with the community? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aida, for this uh, question and for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be here with all of you. Um, well, my uh, involvement in healthcare goes well back, <laughs> a long time back. Um, uh, I have been I have worked in the healthcare system in the United Kingdom, where I lived. Um, I was part of the workforce of the National Health Service. Um, before that, I studied to be uh, a food chemist because I just wanted to make food healthy for people. Then I moved on to the clinical realm. I was working in a hospital, doing research and providing clinical um, analysis to samples in, in a hospital in the United Kingdom. And then I moved to, to the US and I'm doing now public health. Um, however, my involvement with the Latino community has been since I arrived into the, U, the US. And, and this is mainly for two reasons. Well, my background, my professional background, uh, but also my ethnic background. I am Mexican uh, and I consider myself a Latina in the United States. Uh, and because I have lived in these two countries, Mexico and the United Kingdom, where there is free health service, free health care to residents. Uh, in Mexico, the constitution guarantees uh, access to health care for free. And as it is in the United Kingdom, um, and me being part of the workforce in the National Health Service, providing the services for free to patients, but also me being a patient. I had free, very good health care services and dental services for me and my family. So I enjoy this privilege. So when I came here, I just realized, wow, I just learned about all the health disparities that are in this country and how my own Latino community was suffering as well as many other underserved communities. Uh, so I just thought, wow, I have to do something with my skills, with my with my time, with, with this desire <laughs> to help my community. I just found it, it was my moral duty to embark in public health here in the US, uh, helping my Latino community. Um, because health is a human right, okay? And, and my community is entitled to it as well as everybody else. So um, that's how I, I have been working in healthcare. And really I'm very passionate about it. Um, different health systems are different in, all, in every country. And even here in the US, I have been learning uh, well, it's very different, even in counties, right? In Washington state and from state to state. So all this has been a learning curve for me. But the more I learn, the more passionate I become and the more willing to do something uh, for my community to overcome these barriers to healthcare. Uh, also aside, well, I have been collaborating with the Latino Center for Health. I recently finished a graduate certificate in public health at UW. Um, and I have been volunteering in many different organizations uh, here in Seattle, helping the Latino community, mainly in topics related to health, because that's my background. Um, and as you said, I'm a promotora de salud at the Ventanilla de Salud at the Mexican Consulate. Um, and here and there, we help mainly Mexicans um, who have barriers to access healthcare. But really, everybody's welcome, and I'm just very happy to help the Latino community because we are we are not a monolith, right? We come in all flavors, sizes, and and everything. But but I consider myself part of this community, and and I just don't like all the disparities and the barriers that that this community and all of the underserved communities face. Thank you, and thank you for all the work that you do with our community. I. I know personally that, uh, yeah, it, the healthcare system varies from place to place, and some people are privileged and, and can experience better healthcare than others. So that, um, Antoinette, um, would you like to share uh, your experiences embarking on uh, this journey in the healthcare system and working with the Latinx community? Sure, thank you for the, uh, the question and good afternoon, everyone. Very nice to meet you all and it's a pleasure to share my experience with you. Um, so I, I consider myself Chicana Latina. You know, my grandparents were the ones who came over from Mexico and um, 
I'm from California, originally from um, East LA, from East Los Angeles area, and grew up moving around in, in the LA area. Um, my desire is, is, is to be a service to my community. And so just growing up in East LA and in and around that area, um, I saw a lot of needs. And as you said, you know, we're very diverse uh, communities. Um, you know, my parents, they worked for the post office. And so they were lucky to have good, you know, union paying jobs and um, health care. And um, my grandma, for example, my dad's mom, you know, she cleaned um, homes and commercial buildings and I grew up helping her clean. And I saw that, you know, she didn't have the same access to health care as we did in, in our nuclear family. And so when I was in I, I thought I always wanted to be a doctor, you know, in terms of, you know, helping within the area of health, because I was very interested in science and math and um, very good at it. And I only knew about if I wanted to work in health, that I could be a doctor or there was a nurse. But the way the hierarchy, you know, of health care, of the system and of the workforce, um, it, it puts doctors over nurses. And um, so I wanted to be the doctor. Um, it wasn't until I got into college actually that I even learned that something called public health even existed. And which I think that's a very sad fact that I had to get into college, pass all those barriers, go jump through those loops to, um, to find that public health existed in, in uh, this science or this field of being able to, to keep populations healthy versus individuals as doctors do. All important roles, all of them. Um, and so that really, you know, it stirred passion in me and I really liked the approach to public health. And, and um, yeah, I thought, I always think about my grandma. If grandma doesn't have insurance and she doesn't have access to a doctor, how's, who's gonna keep grandma healthy? How, who's gonna support her, her health? Um, and so that's where public health to me really felt like a good fit because it's about keeping communities healthy, populations healthy, especially through preventive, um, you know, access to healthy foods, access to active lifestyles, um, you know, uh, reduction of, of exposures to toxins and secondhand smoke and that sort of thing. And so um, that's what really drove me to get involved in, in health, the health field. I, I, th I find it interesting that you mentioned this um, aspect of collectivity and individuality within the healthcare system. Um, and that kind of leads me into my next question as to why is representation important for the Latinx community in the healthcare system? And what does representation look like in your role? Um, Amber, would you like to start us off? Sure. And yeah, I think that to add to that, the you know, it's it's important to have someone in the room who can understand your experiences. And I think a lot of people know that and relate to that. And the Latinx community is diverse, right? It covers many cultures and countries. And so representation can help bring that understanding, right? Um, that's not so much, they, the person will be able to necessarily understand that individual's exact experiences, but understand that solutions should be tailored and flexible um, and not adhere to a standard, right? A certain approach that's in the book, right? Right there, written out, not created yet. A lot of this work is done, not on the fly, but it's a lot of this done is, is being done for the very first time because they're responding to the needs of communities who are just, have been ignored, um, have not addressed their problems for the long, a long time. Um, that said, you know, representation's really important, but without like the system to support that representative, then it's just going to fall flat. Nothing's going to change. There's not going to be that, that drive forward. Um, and so the person who goes in, like comes into a role who is that representative um, should be positioned in a place, in a place where that they understand they're in the system, right? That is not tailored for their community. And they're gonna be in a constant position of pushing back, right? They're gonna be in this, you know, this tension for, for a long time. And so the person who's in that role should build skills on um, how to be an ally, find their allies. When you walk into the room, who's doing the same work that you're doing? It doesn't even have to be someone who's Latinx. It can, you can find those, those intersections and actions, right? 
And so I think like that representation is important, but it's it's also the acknowledgement of the limitations of the system, you know, and that's really driving all of this, right? Um, I think that collecting one of the things that I learned early on is the importance of working like within a team. Um, but especially over the past year, working at LCH, the, the importance of collaboration, connecting, really understanding the problems that you're trying to solve. Um, and when I, I think when I, I mentioned audiences before, right, uh, I, I consider an audience a, col my, a collaborator. Um, when I, I know, you know, we're trying to get that tweet out, right, or that email out real quick, you know, you're not always kind of thinking about that, but I try to make it part of my process of, you know, I'm collaborating with the audience, you know, we're working together to, to find a way to get a message out that is going to get them to that vaccination site, that's going to get them to, you know, the information they need to know about um, a cancer that may run in their family. Um, that's something that in my family, my grandmother, I, I did not meet my grandmother on my mom's side. She died of um, of cancer, breast cancer, and she she just didn't know what was available to her, available to her, um, based on some of the stories I've collected from my family members. And she, my grandparents, they were part of a union family, um, and the union was really supportive. But at the same time, it was limited because they were just they lived in Southern Colorado in a small town where you either worked for the steel mill down the street or you or you you um, you picked uh, beets and um, whatever was harvested that year down the road. And so there there was there wasn't a lot around them, a lot of information. People were coming into their towns sharing information. They had a bookmobile that came in every so often for the kids, and, and that was about it. And so that, that's really important to for that representation to also build this trust among communities that are so isolated and put placed on islands by these systems. I think that's like, really, I'm over the past year, I've really learned that communications is such an essential part of healthcare um, to build that trust and that, that moment where you, you find a way to, to help someone. And it really starts about that person trusting that you're going to do that for them. Thank you for sharing. Um, going off of this idea of trust, Antoinette, how how does representation um, help build this trust in in your role or in um, yeah in your role? Mm -hmm. um, you know when so you know my role right now is policy director. I'm working in the policy. I help our research center bridge the research and evidence that we generate you know, stories with policy making. So bridging that with the legislators and other key decision makers. Um, but, you know, when you're talking to, to, you're working with community, partnering with community, um, that is all built on trust and trust takes time. And, um, and you don't get instant trust either when, you know, as a Chicana or Latina working with, you know, community leaders um, in our diverse uh, Latinx, Latina communities, um, I have to invest time as well and prove myself, right? And, you know, what my goals, what our goals are being transparent and accountable. Um, but that trust starts with a common language. It starts with um, uh, making ourselves vulnerable, um, transparent with one another. And when we have, we share stories, we share food, we break that bread. Um, those points of commonality, you know, allow that trust to develop and flourish. And uh, the best work comes from trust. Um, and, and it's really the shortest route also. While it takes time, um, you don't backpedal because something blew up because trust, not, it wasn't built in trust, right? Um, the best policies come out of uh, trusted relationships and partnerships with community, those impacted by you know, we can be well intentioned, um, but unless you know we're co-creating and um, and entrusting relationships, um, we're not going to come come out with the best you know policies and policy making. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the the building trust is is, is trying to take. Um, 
everybody's best interest at heart, right? I think that we want our community members to, to be able to, to feel this. Um, Aida, uh, how does this look like in, in your role and, and why is representation um, important in, in your role? And, and I, I have a question specific for your role, which is uh, what are promotoras de salud and, and what is their specific um, contribution um, to Washington state communities? Yeah, sure. Lina. Well, um, I'll tell you a little bit of history and uh, terminology. I will tell you a bit of terminology and explain terminology before I answer directly your question. Um, uh, there is a term called community health workers, right? These are, they are members of the community and they are considered professionals, but members of the community who focus on improving community health, individual health and health access. Yes, and they do this by providing uh, education, connecting to resources. This is a very broad umbrella term. And, um, and they are the bridge between communities and healthcare systems, broadly speaking. And there are, this model of community health workers exists in many countries. Uh, in the United States, they have been recognized since the 1960s uh, when they were helping uh, native, native um, communities and uh, Latin American immigrants to access the healthcare and to um, overcome barriers to healthcare. At that time, they were called lay health advisors. Uh, but since then, th this, this concept has evolved, has the, the roles have expanded, and their importance in healthcare and their role towards the population health uh, has been recognized more and more each time. Uh, now, promotoras de salud, to answer your question, uh, you will find maybe in the literature and in many places that it's they people say that promotora de salud is the translation, the Spanish translation of community health workers, and it is not. Um, promotoras de salud are community health workers. They do the same role as community health workers, but they belong to the community they serve. Promotoras de salud belong to the Latino community. Latinx, Latina community and serve the Latinx, Latina community. And they provide their, their services in a culturally and linguistically relevant manner. This is in Spanish or indigenous languages. So this is the difference. So we are community health workers, but <laughs> we are called promotores because we belong to the Latino community and we serve the Latino community. So we belong to, we help our people. Right. There are community health workers who help the Asian communities, many different communities, and they are called community health workers. But those who perform the role of community health workers, and they are both uh, of Latina origin and serve the Latino community, they are called promotores de salud. So uh, and that's that's what they do. They bridge these gaps. Um, they they help address and overcome these barriers to access to healthcare. Uh, mainly, uh, well, I have found that health here in the U.S. is very reactive. Um, in other places, it's more uh, uh, preventative, what Antoinette was saying. Uh, it, there is a lot of focus on, on health promotion and preventative measures. Um, so promotoras de salud have a very, very important role in, in health promotion because they educate people on healthy habits, um, on healthy lifestyles, just what Antoinette was saying. Um, and this overall, at the end, they, it this uh, improves the health of the population. Now, in the reactive side, they connect people to healthcare. They connect people to resources. There is something that we call in, in public health, the social determinants of health, which are all the, all the aspects outside of health, the social aspects, calling transportation, housing, food insecurity, all these, all these things in, in the life of everybody who really um, determine if you can be healthy or not, or if you or if 
given the fact that you have access to healthcare, if you actually can go to a medical appointment, maybe you cannot go because you don't have transportation, maybe you have you work very long hours and you don't have the time to go to your medical appointments, maybe you don't have childcare, or, or you have caretaking responsibilities and you cannot leave your house. So promotoras de salud help connect the community to resources, to social resources as well. Uh, so it's it's a more holistic approach. Uh, in order to improve the overall health and well-being of the community. Sorry, this was a very uh, long answer and uh, <laughs> went in different tangents, but but this is really what Promotoras de Salud do, and they provide the services in in a culturally and uh, linguistically relevant uh, manner for the Latino community. Thank you for sharing. Um, I I. I want to go off of this idea of breaching the gaps uh, between the community and the healthcare system um, through through different methods, uh, right? Um, which leads me to my next question of why is it important to have a representative that looks like you? And by this, I mean someone who shares the same culture, ethnic background, language, skin color, and and how does this help build on this trust that we talked about earlier? Um, because I'm guessing that some of these are what actually bridge this, this gap between our community and our healthcare system. Um, Aida, would you like to um, retake the conversation since we just since you were just talking about this? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, well, representation on the first hand, it, it matters because it represents inclusivity, right? <laughs> so you need to feel included. You need to feel because you're part of of all of it, you, so you need to feel included. And this goes both for health professionals and, and patients. Um, and now regarding trust, uh, yes, just what you said and what Amber and um, Antoinette have shared, the fact that Promotoras de Salud, talking about the Hispanic community, Latino community, Latinx, Latino, uh, because we speak the same language, uh, we share the same culture. And it's not only that, I could say, yeah, we come in different color sizes and so on, but it's not it's not like we look like them. We we feel like them, right? We we breathe like them. We share same experiences. Uh, in my case, um, I have been um, working more with the immigrant community, Mexicans. I am an immigrant. I am a Mexican immigrant, so I completely understand what they are facing. I have faced the same struggles, navigating the US health system, not understanding, uh, completely different culture. I, I have faced the same, the same experiences, the same struggles, the same concerns, the same worries. Um, so in that sense, Promotores de Salud have, have this advantage, right? Because we don't only look and speak and, and have share the same culture, we share the same, um, the same story. And this, I think all of these aspects, they, they, they organically connect people, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's a different culture. This, this I mean, this happens in all cultures. All these things, all these shared aspects connect people organically. And if you share all these, this, this helps being, build empathy. And empathy builds trust. And trust uh, creates strong, and long lasting relationships, which are extremely important in healthcare and in health, but for both healthcare professionals, public health professionals, promotoras de salud, you need to engage the patient. If they don't trust you, they are not engaged. So all this is, that, that's how all this is connected. And, and the role of promotoras de salud, because, because you belong to the community, you don't have um, this um, professional, targets or goals or, uh, you know, as researchers, we can help in research and we can help researchers as long as they are going, the research is going to help the community. But we don't have this, these goals. Our own interest is personal. We have, because we want to help our community. That's that spiritual connection and this urge to help our community. Um, so I think in that sense, uh, all these characteristics are very special for promotoras de salud. And I think really all, all this needs to be taken into advantage in order to improve population health and well-being. Um, uh, 
I, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the role of promotoras de salud is very important. And, and, and as Antonet was saying, building trust is it, it's not easy. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes what she said, showing. You need to show, right? So that people can trust you. And this is already something that promotoras de salud have, have got. And sometimes for physicians, even it's it's hard to build this trust with their patients. So promotor, that's how promotoras de salud can bridge here. Um, this this big gap uh, and the benefit for of everybody, right? The, the own patients, health, the community health, uh, the, 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 the own health system. Actually, there is um, there is evidence that the role of the, the promotoras de salud help save uh, healthcare costs. So <laughs> this is an everybody's benefit, really. Yeah, I, I, I like that you say that it's um, you have to be an active participant in your community. You have to, you have to show up. Um, and you mentioned something about how you can um, your role helps uh, move and advance research and you, you work along researchers and academics as well. And I think this might fall into your field, Amber, of, of being a communication specialist. Um, kind of going back to the, the question like, um, why is it important that uh, to have someone like you in, in this position to, to help bridge this gap between our community and um, the healthcare system? Right. Um, I think that, you know, in research and in work, um, it's, it's important to really kind of, I mean, we all know we, we live in a racist society that marginalize, marginalizes brown and black folks you know, period. And so that's something that folks, brown black folks are living with on day to day basis and seeing someone who has, you know, for example, maybe um, the same dark skin as you, you know, my one of my best friends, um, she, she never saw anyone and she she went into the health healthcare field, who really had who looked at specifically like her. And she said that now that she's working, She's having um, even kids who come visit the office and everything really look up to her. And when you see yourself in a person, communication improves, uh, trust improves, um, reciprocal relationships are built. And, and so it, it seems like it's something so simple and maybe not even all that important, but it's just that, that connection, right? Um, and I think with uh, some of the projects that I'm working at, I, I'm working with uh, collectives who are being really intentional on, you know, it's not about going out and like shaking down, you know, data from the community. It's about finding representatives, you know, really thinking about who, who do we want to talk to and do they need us and why and finding that it's not just that commonality and how we look but a commonality and goals and how you can continue to build that reciprocal relationship, which is what we're trying to do with bridge. Uh, the, the research project where we're collecting stories of COVID-19 pandemic stories to get an idea of the needs of the community, the healthcare needs, um, and really the needs that they need specifically to, for, for research. And we're finding that, that a lot of folks, that a lot of one of the things that's coming up is risk. And I think with some activists I worked with before and just the work that you know we all do we all know that when you work within a system and push against it there's an element of risk that comes with it you know either lose your job or don't get as you know the care that you should get because the person doesn't like what the questions you're asking right but there's always this level of risk and so it's if you can become a partner in risk then you, you just start opening up the project even more and it just becomes this really organic not organic more so um collaborative piece truly collaborative piece um between you and you know who who you're researching and so i'm, I'm very much all about that co-authorship I, I have a particular passion about that and so anywhere I, where i can work in that world where i you know can work with co-authors rather than um you know participants right or you, you know this the, the data set that that's something that i know inspires me so and i think it gets to the stories that we need to make to to build on what aida was saying is that we need to get ahead of all this 
we need to understand each other better. You know, we're just responsive, responsive, and we're just not in the future. We need to kind of think about that future. So I think it's all wrapped up in that, in that moment when you see someone who looks like you, right? Who maybe have a similar mannerism or even the same Spanish accent type of, you know, from the region, you know, it, it is just like, it's that connection, like you're here. I see myself in you, yourself in me, and you can kind of move forward from that. Thank you. Um, just a quick follow up on that. Have you found that that having this this similarity in in culture, like, has um, made research um, maybe like has facilitated your research and and, and these methods of communication um, with the community? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Like, have you? sharing these similarities of, of culture personally, has it facilitated um, your own research and, and, and your own connection to the community? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to, you know, growing up when I, we moved around a lot, right? Um, my dad was in the Air Force for, you know, a few years, but then became a contractor and moved around a lot. And we lived in several different states. And no matter where we lived, we, we kind of anchored in and we're like, okay, you know, do we have a community here? Is there anyone who looks like us basically? And then we ended up landing in San Antonio, which is a great place to be, right? And uh, if you're definitely, you know, if you have like Mexican culture, if you're Latinx, um, it's very celebratory. Like there's a lot of celebration going on and it was easy to find, you know, folks like me. And then when I moved to Seattle, it was kind of back again, okay, you know, where are the folks who look like me? And so I'm always kind of asking that question, why does that matter, you know, as I work on my research? Why does it matter that, like, I need to find someone who looks like me? Why does it matter that this person needs to find that person that looks like them? And, and, and so I, it does definitely inform my research, informs, you know, the capstone I'm look at, working at, and then all the projects I'm contributing to, because it's that migrant experience, right, of, Working is, is like right now, I know my, my family has like, again, a strong history in um, migrant work, right? There's like a strong history between a relationship, relationship between Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado. I won't get into it, but it's just, it's, it's part of us, right? And you move, you go to a place and you look around and you, you see what's around and you try to find those connections. Um, I think that that trends, one of the stories that I, I shared the, um, the the symposium videos there, and one of the stories that really stood out to me is from Giselle from the Justice for Women, um, um, the Intercommunity Peace and Justice Center, and she's Justice for Women coordinator. But she she talked about how she had to shut down her programming, and she was concerned about like thinking about the next crisis. And once COVID hit, right, she had to shut everything down. And she had programs where people would meet in person and tell stories and find a way to, um, to connect and uh, find some kind of therapy, but she couldn't do it. And she discovered that um, she went out, she actually asked um, her community, like, what do you need? How should we do this? And she was thinking, should we do Zoom? You know, can we do that? Are you comfortable with that? And they, they explored a whole bunch of different things. And what turned out was it was Facebook. Um, live that everyone was most comfortable with is because of the technology they use to communicate already. Um, it's how they found each other within the community, right? The women who came from a certain region, a certain place, and it was where they were most comfortable already developed like trust. And so I think it's, you know, it's important to have that circle, right? Where you're facing your peers and facing people who are like you. And, and I think it took like, you know, a lot of you know, the work that that Giselle did to, to find that solution. I think there was a lot of power and elegance to it that's just not recognized, um, creating that, that space for knowledge development and, and um, therapy, right? So I kind of like went a little off-roading, but I think that all kind of combat connects to our to our themes here. It does, thank you. And and it's about sharing our, our personal experiences as well, right? During these times and then 
um, with the community. So thank you, Amber. Um, you did mention something about risk that I thought um, we should kind of touch up on, because when I think of risk, I um, might think also of like a potential limit, right? A limitation that um, I maybe will be adverse to risk. So I set a, a boundary, a limit with that specific thing that I might be facing. So Antoinette, I, I would like to hear your, your, your experience and your stories um, as a healthcare practitioner and a policy director. And what are some limitations that Linux patients and individuals have faced because of COVID-19? Um, how does, how might this look a little different prior to COVID-19, if at all? Sure. Um, if it's okay with you, Alina, I wanted to pick up a little bit on, <laughs> um, just add something to the last question, which is about, you know, uh, representation, right? And in, in that, um, in the patient room, let's say, um, it, or, or whatever, in, in a public health setting, community health setting, it's about not having to explain yourself each and every time, right? So like being around the folks you have an affinity toward, it's because you feel, they feel like home, there's, you know, sense of safety um, and some commonality and you don't have to explain. Like, I, you know, I used to, in a past life, I used to work at CMAR Community Health Centers here in, um, in South King County. And, um, you know, our nutritionist, CMAR employs a lot of bilingual and bicultural folks. Um, they recruit hard to try to get those folks. There aren't a lot out there. And, um, but it, it goes a long way because, you know, let's say you're a nutritionist and you're working with a patient living with diabetes. Um, you know, we've had patients who've just like broken down crying because they're saying, you know, the doctor has told me from a different place, you know, someone who isn't bicultural bilingual, I have to stop, you know, I need to stop eating my tortillas and stop eating my beans. And they just don't understand, <laughs> especially for an immigrant, you know, a stranger in a strange place, like that's the connection to home. And, and just like be told you can't eat beans and tortillas anymore is, I mean, you know, say no more. How can this person be healthy? Um, so it's, so, you know, having these bilingual bicultural, you know, um, nutritionist providers who know, like you only like, that's one of the best, the best smells in the world is a, the smell of fresh cilantro, you know, or the taste of, I'm a frijolera, you know, I can eat beans every single day and I will just happy as, or fresh tortillas, that first fresh tortilla, you know, made, um, there's just, just fluffy and I mean, there's just no other happiness, right? It's just these simple things in life, right? And so to not have to explain yourself, um, yeah, and, and, and just having that representation, I mean, there's research out there, studies out there that show, they've proved that, you know, it improves health outcomes when you have somebody who speaks the same language, who, you know, shares the same culture, similar culture. Um, there's an increased patient satisfaction. Um, you know, my husband is a, a primary care doctor, a family doctor at CMAR. He's also a sports medicine doctor. Um, and he shared with me, you know, there are patients who may not be as happy with other doctors because, you know, they said, doctor, you know, that other doctor didn't even touch me. How do they know what's going on with me? They didn't even touch my hand, you know, my arm, like they're just the importance of like physical touch, you know, appropriate physical touch, but just what does healing mean in a, in a particular culture among a, a particular population? That's not stuff necessarily that's taught, you know, in the books in medical school. Like there, there's knowledge that comes from um, our experience, our living experiences, right? And so, um, and that's not always translated or transferred in, you know, the, the biological sciences and medical sciences. This has to be an immersive experience or a lived experience. Um, and, uh, and it just, you know, as, as Amber and Aida have said, you know, it increases opportunities for um, people like us to be in leadership positions, not just the entry level positions in the healthcare system or in the public health profession or the health policy professions or community health professions. Um, if we see ourselves in the leaders around us um, and maybe, you know, that's the case in Los Angeles or in San Antonio or, you know, New Mexico or whatnot um, and, and harder to see in Seattle <laughs> where there aren't as, as many brown and black people. 
Um, so it's just, it, it, we can imagine where, how far you can go when you see someone like you um, in that place. Um, as far as the limitations and barriers, um, you know, this is linked just with, same with COVID. So this existed before COVID. Um, you know, I got my master's in public health in 2004. So I'm dating myself, you know, that's about 20 years ago here at the University of Washington. And 20 years ago, we were talking about, as Aida was talking, you know, mentioned the social determinants of health, you know, the um, disproportionate health outcomes, you know, among communities of color, BIPOC communities, immigrant refugee communities, um, because we don't have equal access to um, living wages and, you know, stable housing and, and things like that. Um, education, educational opportunities, and, and that actually turns, it, it it shows up in our lives as poor health outcomes. We don't live as long or we have com comorbidities. We live with chronic conditions like diabetes, you know, like heart disease, you know, all these different asthma, you know, all these different um, conditions. Um, Place-based, it allows us, for having living wages um, allows us to live in a certain part of town and, and your zip code is actually a good indicator, as sad as it is, of your health outcomes and how long you'll live and what you're exposed to as far as unhealthy toxins and things like that. Um, and so we've known this for decades, decades. And then, you know, comes along COVID and it's brought a lot of suffering and pain. And, you know, I hate to say it, the silver lining though to all that suffering and death and, you know, unnecessary death and pain has been that it has shined a light on these things that we've been talking about for decades. And so there's this renewed interest, right? And a renewed commitment by our government, by um, leadership, at least, you know, the state legislature, like centering equity, centering BIPOC communities, um, because, you know, the numbers didn't lie, you know, Latinx, Latinx, Latine, um, Pacific Islander Blacks, you know, have died in larger numbers and were hospitalized in more, you know, larger numbers, greater numbers than our white counterparts. Um, and, and so when it came to providing care and even at the public health level, instead of reinventing the wheel, how do we best reach out to, you know, our communities of color to Latinx, Latine? Um, it's just, I mean, it would like played itself. It was, it was actually pretty difficult to watch and see. Um, just like, are you kidding me? We don't have this written out in Spanish. Like we have to reinvent the way making things accessible in our language. Like why isn't that already there? And it just showed a lack of investment in that infrastructure. Um, having the language capacity to reach out to our folks and also a lack of um, investment in our communities. Our communities know the best way to, you know, in our community wisdom and capacity, we know the best way to reach out to one another. We understand, again, the living conditions, you know, that multi-generational housing, like that's not something that was new to us. Like we live that, we know that, we understand it. Um, so when you have a doctor or provider who, um, you know, at the very beginning of, of the pandemic, as we understood that this was, you know, airborne and, you know, um, somebody who shares the similar living experience, or at least the knowledge of sort of the spectrum of living experiences in our communities can, can just ask those follow-up questions like, tell me about your living conditions, you know, who else do you live with? To get a sense of like, are they living in multi-generational housing? Is grandma there, you know, are the grandparents there? Are there young kids there? Are there people who are vulnerable to, you know, um, getting really severely sick with COVID? Um, and can help navigate how to, would you quarantine? How would you isolate? Um, they have a strong sense of, tell me about your work, you know, just like know that a lot of us are central workers, you know, who have increased risk for contracting COVID because my cousin, my, you know, uncle, my tío, my comadre, whatever, um, who also understand like the transportation situation, farm workers, right? Like there are communities, I was on community calls um, with, Latino leaders, Latinx, Latina leaders across the state talking to Department of Health folks saying, hey, um, the farm workers, we need to like get ahead of it and protect them before, I mean, that's just going to be a wildfire, you know, with COVID, like the season's coming up. They can't share 
um, they can't stay in the, the typical housing. Like it's not okay for them to be sleeping in bunk beds. They're sh gonna be sharing the same air. And what happened? Yakima Valley was, you know, the hot spot at one point in the whole West Coast. And that was during the farm worker season. So, you know, those were the limitations and the barriers because we didn't have this common shared knowledge and understanding of all the risk factors, let's say, due to these social determinants of health and political determinants of health. Thank you, uh, Antoinette. Um, can you say that you've uh, seen some of these limitations or, or can you explain some of these limitations, but from the, I guess, more of the healthcare worker uh, like side. Um. Sure, sure. I can personalize it very much so, um, just even with my husband, right? Like I said, he's, you know, a family medicine doctor. Um, he did end up getting COVID, you know, in 2020 before the vaccines came out. Um, and that was very scary for us because it was before the vaccines and, you know, COVID was very, was scarier than um, when, when we didn't have vaccine. Um, and some kind of assurance that it, you know, could prevent hospitalization and death. Um, but we, so we lived in fear really, you know, pretty much every day, you know, there was that shortage of PPE, um, the personal protective equipment. And, um, and you know, he serves, um, a lot of his patients are immigrants, refugees, Latinx, you know, he's speaking in Spanish, you know, to the, our two patients all the time, um, connecting with them. Um, trying to understand their situation. Um, but, you know, he's also Latino, so he's also shares some similar risks. We do have privileges, different levels of privileges. He's a doctor, you know, we live in a different part of town and so on. Um, but, you know, we also have family members and friends who are the essential, you know, he is an essential worker. I got to, you know, work from home, but he showed up at the clinic and, you know, took call at the hospital, you know, um, every week, every single day, um, and could understand that experience of having to go out and work, you know, show up to work physically every day, um, and understood his patients and having to do that you know, uh, was there part of the food system, whether they worked in gross, you know, my brother is a store manager and was working in grocery stores, is still working in grocery stores and with stores that are were decimated by COVID at times is the way the surges came because all their workers, you know, were getting sick and like, you know, people, we, we are connected to people who, you know, are keeping this country going while the rest of us could have the privilege to stay home and do our part, you know, also by staying home. Um, but yeah, yeah. So he, you know, um, shares this living experience, um, and could understand like, okay, what's needed to quarantine and to, you know, isolate. Um, he had an understanding that that took some privilege to be able to isolate and to quarantine. And also when we ask people to isolate, um, if that's going to take a, a culturally relevant, appropriate, and even trusting, um, approach. If we're asking um, somebody who's in a, a household of, I don't know, um, half a dozen people or a dozen people, you know, multi-generational and to prevent that whole household from getting, you know, um, COVID, asking someone to stay at another place um, to isolate, um, they're gonna have to feel that they can trust <laughs> that where that, you know, that's that experience. Who's, how do I know this is not a trick, especially if they're undocumented? You know, how do I know this is not a trap for me? How do I know I'm going to be treated with dignity? People are actually going to care for me. Am I going to be able to communicate? Like, do you understand that isolating from my community is the hardest thing? The, like, this is not a simple ask. Even my husband, who, you know, stayed in our basement got really, got kind of depressed just being in our basement for the 14 days um, because he couldn't see us, my daughter and, and myself. Um, he's used, you know, holding us, hugging us. Um, and we had walkie talkies in that out <laughs> and phones, but um, you know, it, that, that's asking a lot, like just to know that's asking a lot emotionally and spiritually, you know, of our very, you know, social, <laughs> Um, kind of communities, collective communities. So anyway, I can go on and on, but that's just a little sharing, just a little bit of, of the limitations and barriers for providers. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I remember when I got sick too and I had to be locked away and I could hear my family members like laughing in the other room together. And I was like, ah, it's like, like near the wall being like, I'm so close, but I'm so far at the same time. So, and this aspect of closeness, I think is, is very um, important and very alive in our community too, like physically, uh, physically close. Like I think Latinos are very affectionate in that manner and um, also spiritually and, and, and emotionally close. Um, so it's a very, very alive factor in, in, in our culture, I think. Um, but kind of going back to these limitations, um, I wanted to know if, if Aida, you have faced any in being a promotora de salud um, during the COVID pandemic and, and what have they differed from like prior to, to the pandemic and in what ways have they changed or, or not changed? Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit about that experience. This is uh, the, the limitations I have seen in patients yeah. that the patients um, or as a, as, a, as a healthcare, essential healthcare worker um, being a promotora de salud. Um, well, uh, as a promotora de salud, because um, our service is one on one, mm -hmm. right? It's just like as physicians as well. Um, I was personally not on the front line uh, because the services I provide as a promotora are in the Mexican consulate, and the Mexican consulate closed and closed the services for for the promotoras de salud for a long, long, long time. They just resumed uh, a little bit, a little while ago, and then they closed again with the Omicron surge, and they just opened up again. So I haven't been able to be uh, there in person. Plus, I had these uh, childcare uh, responsibilities with school going um, remotely. I had to be here at home, just being in charge of my my son's education. Um, so I personally was not able to do my work right <laughs> in person um so what i what we decided to do in my team was to to go to social media to to inform them our our well my role was informing them um and educating them so we were just doing this through facebook we developed a, a lots of material and, and the same frustration that Anthony just mentioned we were so frustrated because we had to develop it there was no spanish material there and actually, Amber knows about this because we have we have worked so hard in this part. Um, as far as I know, the Spanish-speaking community has been an important part of this state for so many years, for so many years. So th this is another things that that are a bit difficult for me to grasp. Like, well, this is not new. So so where are the systems in place? Where is all this? Um, uh support support network and and how do you expect the latino community who has a very very specific and important role in the economy not only of the country not only of the state but on the country not to care for them it's like well th these are the, the hard things that i have been facing and, and finding but but yeah i was not able to do my job i just wanted to help and the, the only way i was able to help was uh providing the information via social media but first, it took time because first we had to translate it. And it's not only translated, it's, it's transcreated. It, you need to make it accessible for them in the sense that both accessible and, and materialistically, but also it needs to make sense to them. It needs to be easy for them to understand. Uh, and when material in Spanish started to come up from the official sources, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> I, and it was a verbatim translation. I was like, wow, I myself didn't want to read it. I prefer to read English versions because it was easier for me to understand them. So we had to work on all these, all, and all this slowed, slowed our role on informing our people. Um, so this is one of the things at some point we weren't communicated. But in different senses, because people who were not able to connect to Facebook or to see our social media, they, they relied in radio. We we had collaborations as well with radio, with El Rey radio station. But it has only uh, certain, um, um, it only goes to certain parts of the state. So other parts of the state 
how do you communicate with them? Luckily, there are many groups of promotoras around the state and, and promotoras uh, in the East. They, they are amazing groups. They are amazing and wonderful. They have done really good things during the pandemic, and you will be able to see some of these stories in the links that uh, Amber shared. Um, but I think all of us, we had to adapt and invent the wheel several times as the pandemic evolved. Uh, so, so I think there are so many learning points from this, and I just hope, my hope is that we take them <laughs> into account, that they don't go away because, because this has been so costly, so, so costly, and we cannot make these mistakes again. Um, and well, the patients, the patients in the healthcare system, they missed appointments, they were incommunicated. Uh, the lack of Spanish or indigenous languages. I mean, if Spanish was a problem, material and information in indigenous language as well, <laughs> that was completely non-existent. Um, so here the role for communications specialists uh, is, is, is huge. It's huge during the pandemic. Um, so yes, as a promotoras de salud, we had to work very closely. We are not communication specialists in, in printed forms, in graphic form. We do our job, actually, I struggle designing printed material because, because it comes naturally to me when I'm on one-on-one -on -one with somebody, as everybody has said, sometimes with, a, with this, the unspoken language says a lot, right? We feel, we infer other people's feelings. We know what they are thinking. And because we share all these experiences, culture, uh, sometimes we just know. <laughs> and, um, Yes, it has been very challenging for promotoras, even those who have been on the ground, because as, as Antoinette was saying, those who have been on the front line, they have been exposing themselves as well, right? Uh, sometimes they haven't had the resources, uh, not only the informational resources, but, but also, well, if, if I want people to come and get vaccinated, but they are not vaccinators in my area. So how do I do this? If I want people to get tested, to, to stop um, the transmission, of the disease. So, but there are no testing sites close to me. So what do I do? People come and ask me and I cannot provide them with the tools. I'm used to provide them with tools. And here I, I don't even have the tools. Um, so, so the implications have been a lot, a lot, but, but, but they're having also wonderful stories. I mean, once we all over come all these situations, because I think promotoras are used to work with what we, they have. Uh, they were very resourceful. This, this collaboration has been amazing after, well, the pandemic, this is one of the wonderful things that have brought uh, all this collaboration. We all have common interests, but I think to my view, for the first time, these collaborations are being built and in this, with this strength. So um, there are wonderful examples. And actually there are many, many stories of success in vaccination rates, testing rates, uh, contact tracing, so many, so many things that, uh, promotoras as a salud were able to do and helped uh, reduce the burden of the pandemic in our community. So there are good and bads and, and so many lessons learned that I hope we, we take into account. Um, Alina, I can share some, an example. Yes, um, please. Of what Aida is talking about. And yes, I think working, I'm gonna share my screen here in a second, but working, I worked for a couple of Spanish language newspapers early in my career and the copy desk for those newspapers, they, um, there was one person who I, I worked with, Javi, and um, he, he was just such a stickler, like I, it was my job to make sure the accents were on correctly, right? And it's just so much uh, like effort that went into the language and making sure it was accurate, right? As you know, any news, newspaper should operate, but when you start working in a space that traditionally generates content for English speaking audience, and the moment you put in the idea of translation and creating a Spanish version of a document, it becomes, it becomes not as, it's almost like it's not as, it's not worthy of that time, not worthy of that effort. It's obviously it's not to, to the system because it hasn't really considered it before. And so that's that's one of the huge going back to what I was talking about, Antoinette, is just the language, just the um, the fact that we we just didn't have that set up. Um, and so, kind of going off of that, and then 
what Aida was talking about with you know examples and everything. This is a map that I created, it's like a Google My Map map. Um, I originally was a, a class project for my cultural studies class, and then I collaborated with Antoinette and folks at LCH to represent the uh, LCH, the symposium, and it includes like the speakers, where they where they're calling in from, where they work in their communities, gives you a good visual, and you can kind of see folks if you, um, if you click on it. And well, this one is a data point that shows the population. Um, but what I want to point y'all to is these isolation zones is which I focused on in my research, I, I found like a theme of isolation um, within communities, right? They weren't being connected to communications properly. Um, and so one was in Quincy oops, and the other one in Vancouver. So Vancouver, um, it was so it was, it was like a really unique experience um, situation because Vancouver actually most of their television and radio broadcasting comes from Oregon, so they they're not getting state communications on the latest updates on where to get a vaccine where to get testing they're getting Oregon communications. And you, everyone knows if you, you know, pay attention to the news, every state has its own approach and opinions on COVID-19, even on the severity of it, right? And so this disinformation is like from the beginning, you know, not, not only is um, Spanish culture, um, Spanish language and Latinx culture is not prioritized. On top of that, they're getting the wrong English, you know, communicate, well, not wrong, but they're getting, you know, from a source that's not of their state, not where they're paying their taxes, not the resources aren't available to them, right? Um, and so that that was that was like definitely a barrier and still is a barrier. I think that was an ongoing barrier, you know, for a while. Um, and Dr. Linares was really really ex explaining that and um, also mentioned that telehealth is just not um, very helpful in com their community because of a lack of access to tech. Um, and then you have Quincy and Quincy, um, Mary Jo Ibarra Vega reported that state officials and folks who would you would expect to come into town and start telling them this is what's happening, this is what we're doing, setting up a tent, setting things up just didn't happen. They just didn't come by. And so the community was faced with trying to make it sense of it all among themselves based on what they knew, which resulted in disinformation, um, fears, you know, and it, it made sense that all of this happened. And what ha um, you know, the isolation they experienced um, exacerbates, exacerbated the confusion and fear. And people were afraid if they, um, they would stop working, if, if they reported they had COVID, they were gonna lose their jobs. Um, they didn't have like money for diapers, you know, just there's so much going on all at once, all at once. And it was the turn to the promotora model that really pulled them all together. They they really set they started setting up stations and local businesses where folks would go in and they would get, you know, their call cards usually or um, get the, the food that they needed for their home. Um, going to these these stores, these tiendas, and making relationships with local um, leaders who were not necessarily you know you know voted in leaders you know like with a title, but folks who had access to a space or a resource that was valuable to the community, and they all worked together. And um, but in addition to the promotora model um, to to solve a lot of these communication problems and pass on information that was, you know, accurate and helpful. Thank so you. I think it just shows like there's each committee, even though we have, there's like these common denominator problems, each community faces their own special specific, you know, problems that they have to work together to, to solve. Thank you for sharing the map. I think it's it's good to be able to visualize these these communities in, in relation to, to how far away they, they can even be from each other and, and how that affects them as well. Because um, I think the closer you are in community, right, you can lend that support easier, but the farther you are, it's it's harder and you lose that that empathy that we talked about as well. Because um, what we can't see, we can't, isn't tactile, it just starts to fade away. 
Um, but thank you so much for sharing all your answers and, and, and the resources. I would kind of want to open the, the room now or the time for a Q&A from our students and from our participants. So if you have any questions at this time, please feel free to like unmute yourself and ask the question to our speakers or type it in the chat and we'll read it out. Um, yeah. Alina, while people are thinking about their questions or chatting them in, um, I wanted to pick up on something about the limitations um, you were talking about with healthcare workers. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to say was just, you know, to mention the minority tax. When you're just, you know, 3.5% of the population of providers in the state, even though we make up, you know, as a population, Latinx, Latinas are 13.5% of the state's population, but we only make up like 3.5% of the physician workforce. Um, those physicians are working like overtime or double time, right? And so as, as much as healthcare workers across the board are burnt out and overwhelmed and, and so on, when you have the language skill set and the cultural, you know, understanding capacity, and you're, you know, one of the few in your clinic or in the hospital who can meet the needs of these, you know, of the Latinx, you know, patient population. Um, it's just, it's a whole nother layer of burden uh, of um, what demand of demand because people like my husband, you know, love serving their community, um, but there are only so many of them to go around. And so I just wanted to point that out that, that you know, it's another reason why we need to see more people like us in, in the healthcare system and um, healthcare leadership and, the, and throughout the whole spectrum. Um, because it's just, it's especially during a pandemic, it's too much to lay on, you know, such a limited number of people. Thank you, Antoinette. Um, we actually have a question from one of our students, Emily. Thank you for asking. It says, um, how do your roles help bridge the gap between the Latinx community and the mental health care during this time period, especially given how mental health is a taboo within our culture and the limited access to mental health professionals who can give treatments appropriate to our context? Um, I remember seeing in the symposiums, Amber, that you worked on um, an event um, where you talked about uh, mental health with other health practitioners. I don't know if you maybe wanted to start us off answering this question or any of the speakers. Well, I think Antoinette can definitely add to this, but I'll, I'll quickly say one of my takeaways is um, the, the mental health panel, I, I really recommend, like if you were to watch, my, all the panels are great, but I, I think that one, um, I really learned a lot about the importance of finding the right space for people to share their, their experiences like in, in therapy right um it's a lot of it is like going to folks and asking them how can i get you there what do you need and doing that initial q a right doing that that's that research right and going out and asking and sometimes it, it has to happen in layers. And sometimes we've said this a couple of times, it takes it takes some time and it takes that promotora model, someone walking, passing by, knowing like, you know, just like, hey, how are you doing? Walking through the community on a day-to-day -day basis and touching base with people and getting a sense of like their needs that way. That way it's not as like direct and like in your face, right? It's It's getting to know the person as you get to know their needs. And, and all of that, you know, it's just, it goes to, you know, I, I mentioned Quincy, right? How they didn't get initially a lot of support from the outside, from the state that you expect, but um, no matter what, no, even if like the state came in like full with, you know, everything, you still need local leadership to lead the way. You still need like the local representatives to say, this is where we're going. You know, not someone who's like a stranger outside of your community. And so all of that is just it just takes some time. Um, and specifically, you know, from a communication standpoint, what platform are you going to work on? What works best for them? Um, yeah. And Antoinette, I don't know if you want to add to that. Antoinette helped organize the symposium. Sure. Um, 
I think, you know, as the question um, demonstrates, there's there's the stigma, right, with mental health. There was also grossly um, an under uh, a staffing shortage of mental health professionals and so on. So um, I think this was an opportunity where um, we learned again or were reminded of the value of those community um, trusted advocates, the promotores de salud, um, to help link, you know, to help, um, whether it was through public health, community health, through um, promotores, uh, just to link folks with the resources that there were, especially the bilingual, bicultural, mental health, you know, um, therapists. Uh, and for those who had access to Zoom and so on, you know, um, on the plus side, it did allow um, these limited therapists and professionals to be able to provide their services to more people, especially, you know, with support groups and so on versus, you know, maybe just one on one. I think people really leaned into support groups with all that anxiety, depression and isolation. Um, sometimes, you know, just that connection being a part of a support group went a long way um, for people who um, are so used to connecting, <laughs> you know, um, to being social in an everyday basis. Um, and uh, so I invite, you know, Aida to speak a little bit more about the role of promotores de salud. Yeah, sure, I will, I will add to this. Um, Emily, yes, you're, you're right that um, this is a taboo. This has been well before COVID. I think uh, we have been putting a lot of effort on mental health and educating the community about mental health issues um, and the support that is needed um, well before COVID. Just COVID exacerbated all this because of all the conditions, right? The, the pandemic brought up, up on us. But what is true is that at least here in Washington state, that's what I can talk about is there is a shortage of mental health providers there is a shortage of mental health providers who are bilingual and bicultural. Uh, so this is this is a topic that we have been advocating for well before the pandemic, because the need is there, but there's no supply. Um, so we have been trying, you know, the role of promotoras is to uh, up to a certain limit because we're not professionals. We, we don't have the credentials. Uh, but there are, you know, there are certain stages where you can um, educate people. That, that's our role, educated people to empower them, to make the decisions, to help themselves in their health. Um, so it's just telling them about healthy lifestyles, uh, these uh, relaxation techniques, these community groups, support groups, all that, the, the same techniques that we personally use. For, I, I use myself as an example all the time with them because, because I face the same things, right? So what works for me? What doesn't work for me? But what has people told me to do? Uh, so at this level, but yes, that's true. We have, we are limited in the in the help that we can provide at the, up to a certain level because of the lack of mental health providers. Um, the program which I collaborate with the Mexican consulate, this is a program developed by Mexican government in collaboration with the, with the, the Foreign Affairs Office. Um, so there are many pilot programs where mental health help is provided from Mexico by a Zoom um, in Spanish. But of course, this has the limitations as well because for these you need a connection, right? An internet connection, you need to be able to, to link for it by a Zoom. And, uh, and this, all the trust, even if it's in the same language, the same culture, well, it's not easy just to connect with somebody and start talking about these very, very intimate things, right? For some people it's easier, for some people it's, it's more difficult. So uh, so there are so many challenges, but and this is something that we, we recognize and I really hope there's something to, to be done that can be done because, because promotoras, we are limited on the help that we can provide, sadly. One more thing I would add is just um, in our roles, you know, being able to amplify the experiences of young people. What we've learned by listening to young people is that um, there's not such a stigma around mental health. I think young people, you know, feel more comfortable to express and share that, you know, they're feeling isolated, depressed, anxious, um, and, and have been, um, I think it really led the way 
and, and an acceptance of like radical acceptance, you know, when we're, we need help and are not doing well. Um, and so their stories actually, like in even the policy realm, sharing that, bridging that, bringing it to legislatures um, really help them to, I mean, you know, it breaks their heart. So there's a lot of funding going into um, trauma-informed education, care, you know, trying to build up that mental health workforce, um, talking about, you know, um, licensing, how can we, you know, uh, shorten those periods and still provide the kind of benefit that's needed. Um, a lot of really creative thinking right now, thanks to everyone's stories, you know, reaching legislatures. Um, because the need is so great. And this is something that we're going to be carrying with us as a society, because um, the, just the trauma, the different layers of trauma that we've all, you know, experienced, um, it will be with us for, for many years to come. And, you know, the great need to heal on an individual level and societal level. Thank you all for sharing. Um, and thank you for, for all the work you do. I think, I think this work is what will help us heal and, and move us and keep moving towards the future. So thank you, Amber, Antoinette, and Aida for, for everything that you do. Um, I would now, um, unfortunately, it seems like we are at the end of the event. So we can't um, ask any more questions, but if we will share resources to, so you can be able to connect with our speakers if you want to get know more about their work in a minute. Um, but right now I would like for you all to participate in a quick um, post event survey um, after this conversation to, to see what you've learned and, and the information that, that you now know. Um, so I'm gonna launch, a, launch it and And I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, it's just to, to show yourself what you've um, learned from this wonderful experience. I did want to quickly put in, I guess, my two personal sense of how important it is uh, to have a representative in, in, in the healthcare system, because I know when I was uh, looking for help and for um, guidance, it really helped when the person that was guiding me shared the similar culture to me. I, I felt more connected. I felt more comfortable. I... I felt like even though we, we had just met, it, it, there, there was that, that sense of, of, of something that, that made it easier for me to share and to be vulnerable. So um, I, I just wanted to say that um, in regards to the whole mental health and, and healthcare professionals. Thanks for sharing that, Alina. I think it's like, you know, we're, in such a vulnerable space, right? When not only are we, you know, we're a patient and going in for care, um, you know, just already, you know, in a position of possible change, right? A transition depending on the outcome. And then on top of that, if you feel like, you know, the person you're in the room with doesn't understand you at a certain level, you know, it's just, it's, this is it's a real vulnerability to to be there, and I think a lot of folks have these stories. Um, so I, I think part of the work is like is sharing them. 
yeah there's a this sense of frustration when you even if you are connecting with someone and then they're there to help you and they have the best intentions to help you if if you don't feel understood and seen it's 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 like you're like ah but, but why I'm, I'm doing the work i'm, I'm trying to heal and it, there's just not that click that that happens so i through my experiences i've i've recognized that with um my representatives and, and the people who help me that that it's very important to have to establish that connection and i think that goes back to trust right um I personally cannot trust anyone with my health or, or any of my loved ones' health if, if I don't understand them and if they don't understand me. I mean, something as precious as health, it's just, you can't. All righty. Um, I'm going to give folks a couple more minutes or seconds to answer. Um, but I will be closing the poll soon. Okay, I will be closing the poll. Thank you to everyone who answered. It's now time to wrap up tonight's event. Um, I wanted to thank you, Aida, Antoinette, and Amber for joining us tonight and um, the volunteers who made tonight possible. Let's give them a round of applause. We would like to uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. And if you would like to know more about the work that our speakers do, I've created a Google document where we have gathered links, resources, and projects they have participated in. If you're interested in getting involved in future projects or volunteering opportunities, please feel free to reach out to Amber, Antoinette, and Aida. You can find more information about them in our resource document. And if you're interested in future CEB programs, you can stop by and check out our Instagram page at UWB underscore CEB or email us at, at uw-ceb at uw.edu. Uh, we hope to see you in future programs. Thank you so much uh, for tonight. Um, if anybody would like to share any closing words, please feel free to do so. Well, I just want to thank you for the invitation and thank you for all to all the attendees. Um, I hope you, you are better informed. We are very happy to share our experiences and to uh, expand on, on, on these topics, which are very, very long. And, and as you can see, we all are very passionate about it. And, and we're always open to, 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 to share more of, of our experiences and our knowledge. I also want to thank everyone for the invitation and also want to invite anybody who's interested in entering the health field or advancing your career, you know, in the healthcare field or health field, um, please reach out. We need you. You're needed. Um, we, we just need more people. We need more people like you. So thank you. Yeah, I, like I said in the chat, I, I'm just really grateful that students are, you know, there's this next generation coming in, uh, people going back to school, you know, um, and, and focusing on these problems and finding solutions. And if anyone's interested in communications, feel free to reach out to me or, you know, just want to have a chat. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. -bye. Bye, Thank you. Bye.